I'm here with Jack Roberts, uh, who's just published his new book, The Sun Circles of Ireland, Illuminating the Stone Circles of Ancient Ireland. And I have to say it's a beautiful production, Jack. Very, very nicely done. Um, full of drawings and plans and photographs and, of course, words about, you know, the remarkable uh, monumental remains of Ireland focusing particularly on the stone circles of the south of the country. Um, maybe you might just tell us a little bit about how you became interested. Well, first of all, in, you know, ancient monuments in the first place, and then maybe more specifically, stone circles. Hmm. Well, I suppose, to cut a long story short, when I came to Ireland in the mid-70s, I was just knocked out by how much history, how many archaeological monuments there are just lying around. In England it's all a little bit contained, you know, that's the way you've got a Stonehenge and it's, it's uh, you know, the, the land has been ravaged in comparison to Ireland, you know. Right. And um, there's so much more and, well, when you've got, when, when I found myself at Newgrange, I realised that there was something extremely special about Ireland. Because there's nothing like that. Yeah. You know, going east to it. Was there a particular moment in your life that you can recall, like a light bulb coming on in relation to these, or was it over a kind of a broad span of time? Uh, well, I can remember meeting Martin Brennan and him introducing me to all the rock carvings that he was at that time uh, drawing and collating, you know, for the stars and stones. And. Um, just seeing that, uh, because he he was a mad collector, he'd be he'd be looking to get these images and and draw them and uh, put them out there. So, like I was surrounded one night in this flat by all these images, and um, I don't know, they just spoke to me, you know, they just screamed out at me, really, you know, this is just fantastic, um, you know, because they, I didn't see anything like that. Yeah. In all my sort of experience you know, growing up in England, you didn't see anything like that. And there's only there's only a certain amount of inspiration you get out of something like Stonehenge. It's amazing, you know. But it's it's kind of mute. Whereas the monuments of Ireland uh, have always spoken to me in a different way. And the carvings were just, it was just speaking. I couldn't understand the language. None of us can still. But there was, I was found myself with a man who was trying to understand, and uh, so I ended up working with him. Yeah, uh, you're obviously quite an artist <coughs> because, as well as the fact that you've written the book, so you've got a you've you've got an ability to 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 write, you've done the drawings and you've done the photography. So tell us a little bit about your your history as an artist, because you started as a painter, didn't you? And oh. then you you sort of migrated towards. How how did that happen? Um, well, I might, like any artist, you, do, you try different things, I think, you know. You, you look at any artist, they're, they're never just a painter. They've always sculpted, they've always done something else, you know. And in, uh, and as we proceed through the ages, all the artists have tried something like photography, and now they're doing things like on a computer or whatever, you know. So art it hasn't got a boundary, and it never really did, you know. Uh, every good sculptor is also really do really good drawings, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's like uh, I never did see it as one thing really. Painting is kind of a high art in a sense of like you're trying to. It's a it's one thing that you do amongst other a lot of other things maybe, and because it takes time to do a good painting, it's a kind of, it feels like a kind of a high art. You're trying to really say something. Yeah. And yeah, I've always just been pottering around, drawing, painting, doing stuff. You knew, you had a relationship or a friendship with John Michel. Mm. Um, tell us a little bit about that, because a lot of the people who would be listening to this would, would, would be very familiar with that name. Uh, well, I was one of John's many, 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 many friends. John was so gregarious. Um, it was part of being knowing John, was uh, if you knew John, you suddenly, you wouldn't know who you, whose company you'd be in the next minute, you know. 
and uh, John was very welcoming. Uh, John was instrumental in uh, in the, the whole development of Martin Brennan and his work. So I actually met John Michel at the same time as Martin Brennan, and he more or less picked us up at a MOOC in England and dragged us back to his flat. And um, he loved Brennan. He, you know, he, he thought Brennan. He felt the same as me about Brennan that he was a genius, you know, and uh, he supported all the way, you know, he supported the whole thing of the Stars and Stones book, and that whole project, you know. Was there a sense at the time that you were among people who were breaking ground, um, you know, breaking new territory? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah. that's something that comes across in yeah. even the reviews of, say, Brennan's work at the time and, yeah. and Michelle, that they were coming at the whole megalithic sphere from a different angle yeah. to the archaeologists. And it seems that it was much more exciting in, yeah. in, in many ways. We were putting the light. Martin Brennan wanted to put the light back into the monuments. That was his, uh, you know, archaeologists uh, archaeologies sees them as tombs. You know, still we're using this word tomb it's been cast in stone now um, but Martin Brennan I remember him uh, the first time I went to, New to Newgrange for the winter solstice with him he uh, we were there and people were allowed in at that time it was kind of like only the high bods like you know t-shirt or somebody would go in or, yeah you know a burn or somebody you know what I mean yeah it, well it was before the lottery thing and um, we were outside and there were hundreds of people. There's always been hundreds of people going there. I think, I don't know, when did that stop? Coach loads of people. And, um, of course, the, the, the sunrise went up and they, then they let people go in, you know. And I remember Martin Brennan turned to me and saying, you look at these people. There was a lot of school kids going in, or young people, and he said, you watch them. They all go dancing in to see the light and they're told there's darkness and you watch them come out. And he was right. They went in full of light, you know, and they entered the dark and they came out with and they came out with their heads down, you know. And uh, he was just expressing how we need to put the light back in, and that's what it is. It's a, it's a light machine, you know. It's playing with light beams. It's not playing with darkness. Yeah. yeah. Of course, it's difficult to have a conversation with Jack Roberts without mentioning Martin Brennan on a regular basis. Um, so obviously your relationship with Martin, uh, which I suppose a lot of people will be very aware of, um, you know, how much of that was an influence on what you've done and to what extent was it a hindrance or an annoyance in some senses or, or was there ever a case that it was, you know, because what about Jack Roberts, the individual, you know? Uh, do, you, do you feel that's in some no, sense that you've I been in Martin's actually. shadow over the years? No, I didn't actually. Um, Martin was my guru uh, for a certain period, for a few years, and we did great work together, and it was inspirational. And um, and then it all flopped. It was all too early, all too too much for the system. You know, Martin was vilified by the archaeology archaeological circles. So this sort of uh, heady discovering new things, breaking new ground that was going on for a few years, ended up like a damn squib. And um, I ended up just uh, moving back down to Cork, I'd been in originally, and I just carried on doing what I do, which is exploring. Um, so I started exploring like West Cork, publishing books on West Cork down there. I never felt I was under the shadow or I was in the shadow, um, you know, at all, or, or second, second fiddle kind of thing, because I knew so little, and I saw, when I first knew Martin, I knew nothing. I was in company where people were asking me questions when Martin would be out of the room, and I didn't know what they were on about. I was still discovering, you know? And that's the beauty of someone like John Michel. Like, it, it was um, a period where I... I could walk into John Michel's home in the West End of London then, uh, whenever I was over there, and I made a point of going to see John because John just was an open book, and I mean that in the sense that you would end up in his place, I don't know when he slept, it was like six in the morning sometimes, you know, and um, but the whole 
it would just be constantly people coming in, writers, artists, people turning up, and you're surrounded by books, and John's constantly wanting to give you stuff to read. He wants to educate you. You know, that. so it was a very, very intense period uh, that I was just delighted to get. You know, so, yeah. yeah, was there a sense when, as you say, the whole thing flopped, <coughs> And you went down to the south. Was there a sense of, I mean, was there a great sense of disappointment? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Did, did you feel that, um, do, did you feel that you had, you or Martin or both of you had been wronged in that or? Well, I, do, I, I wouldn't say wronged. Uh, I think uh, the way I felt is that it was just, Somehow the dark force had overcome uh, what we were trying to do. I, I saw it in those terms, mm. that the dark forces were battling against it and that it was probably a good thing to just stay clown a bit and uh, not push the button too far because they might come down and topple me. I would have already toppled Martin Brennan he'd left the country. Uh, so I just got down to the groundwork of... Uh, Hey guys, how many stone circles are there around here? Has anyone noticed? And have we, uh, you know, the problems of like trying to educate farmers not to knock them down. Yeah, stuff yeah, like of that. course. Pure simple stuff. Do do, do you remember what uh, year and what time of year it was when you first arrived down there? In, in West Cork. Yeah. Well, I I landed in West Cork. I actually landed. I'm a bl I'm a total blowing the sense that a friend of mine came to Ireland fishing <clears throat> in uh, in the early 70s and uh, at, at some point I brought a boat over to Ireland actually with him from England and because I knew a bit about boats I'm ex-Navy man originally and I was into the sea I was into fishing and I'm still go fishing now um, I, I just found myself sailing to Ireland one day and getting off a boat in Cove in February, at the end of February, and um, just being enchanted by Ireland. Enchanted before I even arrived here, actually. It was like the land of tin and oak yeah. to me. Because we know very little about Ireland. People, millions of people in England, you don't forget the 60 million people in England, they, very few of them actually know anything about Ireland, unless they have an Irish connection in those days, all they knew was guns and bullets, actually. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I remember going back to my hometown there going, oh, you survived Ireland then? You know, that kind of attitude. And you're going, mm. well, actually, I was charmed. <laughs> I landed in Cork, you know. I mean... Um, where, where, whereabouts did you settle in Cork? In, in, well, um, around, the, in the west, like uh, Castle Townsend, Baltimore, that area. My friend was living in Baltimore originally, and now lives in Castle Towns in that one. And when did you realise that there were lots and lots of stone circles down there? Uh, I think it's slowly sort of, because I was originally into the sea. So I came to Ireland by sea, um, uh, and the sea was my preoccupation, really. Uh, but at the same time, I'm I'm, all, I'm also into the land, so I'd be like walking mountains and everything else. And then, you, I mean, I knew what standing stones were. I knew all that stuff a bit in England, but I didn't realise how how rich this land was. I think it started to click into me then. And it isn't just standing stones; it's the whole thing, course, you know, yeah, ancient yeah. walls. It, this is an ancient landscape, you know, yeah. and. Um, so I think that sense of like the deep history of Ireland was creeping in then. And then just suddenly I found myself in Dublin and uh, thrown into the heart of the Bruna Boyne, you know, which was, you know, sold to the centre, <laughs> really, you know. How much um, did, how, how much of a difference did you see? Because you, in your book, and that's one of the things that kind of impresses me, is that, you know, stone circles are, quite different to passage tombs, as the archaeologists call them. Um, and, you know, the stone circles of Cork and Kerry are very different monuments to 
new mm. range now than Dallas. But yet you manage to sort of make this sort of very broad connection. It's obvious that while you're focused on the stone circles of the south of the country, that really this is a book about all of the stone monuments of ancient Ireland. How much when you you know when you compare Bruna Bonia with Cork, um, you know how much similarity do you see, and then how much um, separation do you see? Um, I think I'll try to portray the similarities in the brief thing that I said on the back of the book, which is I've tried to I, I've just simply said everyone basically the very well known uh, winter solstice sunrise alignment at Drum Bay is world famous now you know thousands of people enter the lottery um but over the other side of the country uh, down in the south drum bay is equally precise some could argue even though it's more precise it depends how you see that form of uh, alignment and um and okay there's quite a lot of people go there but it's uh, it, it, it's not such a huge exclusive event as Newgrange you know, but you see, Newgrange is Newgrange, uh, and the Boyne Valley is a cluster of monuments there, and there are clusters of monuments around. But in West Cork, what I'm trying to portray in that book is that it's not one monument, it's a whole landscape covered in monuments that are all interacting and all part of the same kind of scheme, you know. So it's like, uh, yeah, it's on a big scale. And we're not looking at it because we still look at individual monuments too much. Yeah. Is there a particular aspect <clears throat> of stone circles that interests you? Um, you know, is there one element of the study or is it just, you, you know, you were just fascinated overall? Um, you know, it was the astronomy that brought me to really study the Boyne monuments, first of all, you know. Well, the, the thing is, when, when I was, um, after I left, my education kind of in the Boyne Valley with Martin Brennan um, when I went back down to Cork and I was kind of living a quiet life and just doing up an old house I'd be going out on my bike actually uh, looking at all the different standing stones and blah 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 and just starting to collect them all I wanted to know where everything was I'd be strumming through fields and hedges uh, I've trespassed on everybody's land all over West Cork, you know, that's why I thank the farmers in there, because uh, I've had so little hassle, really, but, yeah. I, you know, and, uh, you know, I build up this picture of, of how much there was there, still there, you know, regardless of how much has been knocked off and, and is still being destroyed, and I wanted people to know that. That was a whole, an old, whole other re revelation for me, as how much can a, a chunk of landscape in the west of Ireland contain. And I'm not the only one, people like Tim Robinson have the same revelation about that kind of thing. But uh, inside of all that, the stone circles in Mass Court are shine out more and more. Suddenly you, you realise it's not just, hang on, is it 30? And, da -da, and the figure goes up and up mm -hmm. and up. And then you find these clusters, you find in, you know, whole little groups of them, and you realise, wow, because I'd already realised, had a kind of a picture of what was in Ireland, you know, and stone circles aren't dotted all over Ireland, they are only in certain places. So, like, there isn't one in County Louth, there isn't one, uh, a, a true stone circle, we yeah. could argue about what a stone circle is and yes, the yeah, yeah, and all the rest. Do you know? Do you do you know actually in your own work have you have you have you any reasoning for that or do you think is there anything I that you've it, seen that suggests I think why? It, I think I'm trying to reason with that in that book. Yeah. Because I'm I'm addressing the whole subject of what a stone circle is. A third of that book is is total work discussion. Um, what is what isn't a stone circle? I mean, like I lived in Sligo. Um, which I needed to live in for a few years to encompass what's there. Fantastic uh, cornucopia of megalithic. It's megalithomania. Um, y you know, it, it's, it contains things that don't exist anywhere else. We know it contains the earliest stuff now. Yeah. And um, it just has a, places like the Brickleaf Mountains. Mm. You step back in time. You absolutely step back in time. It's fantastic. Yeah. Isn't that one of the w wonderful, magical things about Sligo? It's the fact that the 
while the focus of the world is on Brunabonia and it's been mm. dug up and excavated and renovated and all the mm. rest, Sligo is older and it's kind of been able to just sit there quietly, yeah. you know, for people to... Let, pe- let the Swedes dig it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's older, it's of older. course. It's yeah. an older landscape. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by as much as, what, 500, maybe a 1,000 years older than the monuments of the point. I don't know, because I went through all the dates again, uh, Europe, Bonnholz work and all the rest of it, and um, you see, this because it's been excavated, it's the area excavated by Swedish teams for the last 30-plus years. And um, they're very... They're living on their... They're living in their little world in a way. They're publishing their reports in Uppsala and it's filtering back to Ireland. I lived in Sweden and I know much more information. You know, You're fun. very well travelled. There's a fantastic <laughs> amount of information on Ireland in the average library in Sweden. You wouldn't believe it. All right. Yeah. And it's because of the guys who are working in Sligo. Of course, yeah. 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 And um, uh, the and then when you're there, you realise why they honed in on Sligo. They weren't fooled by the Bruna Boyne. They knew that the real, the real stuff was there. Yeah. They saw Maeve's Khan. They saw those places, and they went, "That's what we'll do." You know, it's a captivating landscape. Yeah, yeah. And you see, when they found now, it goes back thirty years to when uh, Brennan was still here. Um, they discovered on uh, Crocken Mountain on the south side of Ballisadere Bay. They dug into uh, one of the passage mounds on, on the hill there and they found remains there that were carbon dated 8,000 years. Oh, wow. Now, they didn't make a song and dance about it, mm. you know? They, and they say in their they report... They the said in their, anomalous. Yeah, and they said, yeah, they said in their date, well, it could predate the Khan. Mm. Right, because it was mm. right at the bottom, so they didn't, and they kind of fluffed it. They didn't want to shake any waves, you know. Yeah, that's a wonderful thing, by the way, isn't it? About you and I, and people like us, we operate outside of the realm of academia, so we don't. I know that peer review has its place. Don't get me wrong, but isn't it true that the academics wear a straight jacket in terms of what they can say and what they can't say, and that we have much more liberation and freedom to? Ex- well, it's not. It's not just to make stuff up. It's more about we, we can explore realms that perhaps the archaeologists dare not venture into. I have a great... The way I live, part of the thing that keeps me going is in money terms is that I do the jewellery designs as well as publishing books. And I sell these on the Galway market. And I could give you a long list of archaeologists who come up and basically said keep up the good work because we're all got straight jackets on I mean it happened to me recently again an, arche- uh, an archaeologist working in uh, I forget Dublin I think you know and it happens all the time Ar- archaeologists admire us outside they need us you know and inside they actually do know they need us they need us to you know otherwise it's like a uh, it's like the door with just feeling a foil in power. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, they need us out here to, uh, to make these other observations, you know? They do support don't, us. Don't, don't they think that we're a bit new agey and out there, no? Ah, uh, well, they're right about a lot of people, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, like, uh, I, I found that the only criticisms I find from archaeologists uh, I hear them voicing, is that it, it does get a bit too new agey and wussy, the whole subject. And I totally agree, you know. Um, like, I think we, we've gone to, we, we immediately go off on a very heady trip about a lot of things um, without realising, it's like ley lines. Um, ley lines is one of those things, you now as an old friend of John Michel's, it's difficult to argue this one. And I used to argue it with John. Because I'm I I'm not I'm not a I'm not a aficionado, aficionado of, of, of the whole ley line. A ley line as an energy line, or yeah, a ley line it, as an alignment. You see, and then you go into like energy lines, mm. and then you know I've dealt with loads and loads of dowsers. I I took a American 
Society of Diviners around Ireland and stuff like that. I do know about it. Uh, I've been taught to divine or dells. And um, everybody has their own concept of it. Everybody has a different way of looking at what that is. So that's a personal trick. Yes, and it's quite a subjective thing. Yeah, yeah. it's a very subjective thing. I, I admire, like, I'm not doubting its uh, actuality because I wouldn't have any water. But it's a realm that you don't go into yeah. yourself. But, I mean, we, yeah, but yeah. I mean, we've got water at home. Where a man came up with a, with a water what, a boring machine and was prepared to stake, like drilling a hole 100 metres down there because he felt water. Yeah, and yeah. that was his life. You know, yeah. and there's loads of people like that. There'd be yeah. no water in California, you know. There'd be no crops if, pe- if there hadn't been those wonderful old diviners. But that's different to this whole concept of like putting lines on maps, you know. When I mean, we live in an age with the ordnance survey map, you know, and I don't, I've got a horrible feeling they didn't have ordnance survey maps when they put up New Bridge. <laughs> yeah, I think you might be right about that one. Yeah. <laughs> In in Cork in particular, because this is the area of focus for your. I mean, you've spent a long time down there. I think it's probably twenty years or more now. Is it? Well, it's off and on. It's thirty years. Yeah. Thirty years. Yeah. Is there something in particular about you know the stone circles that connects them for you? You concentrate on the word sun. What's that about? Um. Well, it's, it's part of the whole idea of putting the light back into these things, you know, that I, I use the sun up front, you know. Um, but it's also because um, a lot of them are aligned to significant uh, as, uh, solar astronomical positions, you know, winter solstice, equinox, blah, blah, blah. And I think that the sun plays a sort of fundamental role in that whole thing. Which is signified like by by Newgrange, you know, Newgrange is a line to get capture that light beam. So their whatever their purpose, it's very much connected with the sun, to my mind. Now there's all these other secondary things like the solar, lunar, blah 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 that it might be going on as well. But as Boyle Somerville, the first archaeologist, said, uh, there may be all kinds of alignments. Uh, possible from all these monuments but if we just look at the solar alignments now and 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 correlate them you can work everything else out now you know especially with a computer you can work everything else out if you know where that line is that's very true Um, what sort of percentage of these stone circles would have solar alignments i mean is it a majority of them well i'm proposing that half of them at least half of them over half Yeah. yeah And uh, what I'm saying in the book is, uh, what I'm trying in the book is to portray how, how it's not an easy thing to assess that because um, there's a number of factors involved there. For a start, we haven't gone out. I mean, who's out there now looking at a stone circle and seeing where the sun sets? You know? I mean, there is anybody. I know. Uh, it was, that was a question I was actually just about to ask you. Um... Do you get the sense when you're, or did you over the course of your work get the sense that you were the first person to observe a particular sunrise oh, at this yeah. place in a long, long time, I maybe sp- millennia? I spent my life doing that. Yeah, isn't there something very special about that? You're yeah. kind of bridging, you're you're bridging a huge gap of time. It's like you're c- communing with ancestors, you know. I have um, indulged myself a little in that book by pointing out that I was with Martin Brennan when we discovered the equinox sunrise alignment in the Lockery Mountains in Khan T. Yes, uh, which that's is, one of the things that makes you famous, by the way. Well, it does to a certain amount of people, <laughs> but you could go up there tomorrow with an archaeologist and, and you wouldn't hear Martin Brennan's name, would you? Mm. Um, it's, I don't know, uh, I know people, I question people on these things all the time. What did they tell you at Newgrange when you went to visit there, you know? And Martin Brennan's never mentioned. He's never mentioned anywhere. Not by name, but some of his discoveries yeah, but, are mentioned. Yeah, but this guy, uh, yeah, like, take Lock Crew, which has become the second most uh, well known sunrise alignment uh, uh, in the megalithic mounds. Um, and an awful lot of people go there. I've been there uh, within the last few years. Uh, and students volunteer to open it up at dawn, and it's that's all very good, you know. But 
They never ever broach the subject of who discovered it. They leave it open because they didn't. You know, that place was excavated, open, and Martin Brennan sat there one night with a map and went, you know, we got to go there. And we went there and we saw the sunrise and I photographed it. Yeah. And until then, it was unknown, you know. And there were arguments about it. I remember having arguments in, in Dublin, in pubs in Dublin with archaeologists that there was some, well, so what anyway, you know, that kind of thing. And now they claim it and never mar mention Mark, but because they know that a sunrise at Newgrange is more inspiring than anything, you know, and they want to capture that. Yeah. Is that a sore point? Because it sounds like it's a bit of a... Uh, yeah, it is actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, wouldn't you be a bit sore? Yeah, yeah. You know, if you discovered something now uh, 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 that draws hundreds of people every year uh, to view it, you know, uh, you discovered some artifact or something, and it was in the museum, and people travelled miles to go and see it, you know. So people travel for miles to go and see the Equinox Sunrise, a lot crew, and many, many, many of those are not going there because they've read Martin Brennan. I know, I've been there, I've been in the car park, and um, some do, some don't. But the thing is, archaeology has seen that become famous because of Martin Brennan. And now they go up, volunteers go up, open, they make it available and everything. They even advertise it, it's part of the whole thing. You know, it's like the second thing after Newgrange. But there's not one mention of how, who first saw that, who decided that was so, you know. And when we, when we went up there at the Equinox, you know. You were nobody, the only ones. Nobody had ever gone up. And possibly the first ones for a long, long yeah, time. yeah. You see that sun dance across that backstone. I mean, man, Martin, Martin would dance, you know. <laughs> I've got footage of Martin dancing in there, you know. Yeah, yeah. dancing. An old Super 8 footage. Yeah, I'll give it to Neil Boyle. A sun dance. Yeah. Maybe Neil will finish his film. Yeah, yeah hopefully. <laughs> if he hears this, he might. Um, to, uh, let's just speak briefly, we have to, because, you yeah, know, in 2009, right. Martin came back to Ireland for the first time in over a quarter of a century. And, you know, um, one of the reasons I, I wanted to do that was because I thought there was a good opportunity for maybe a bit of healing. And I really actually feel that that's what happened, that there was healing to an extent. But what did that mean to you for Martin to come back, um, you know, after such a long time? What sort of feelings did you have? And did you feel that there was some sort of, you know, maybe healing? Did you feel better about it afterwards? Yeah, yeah, and there was kind of a resolution to it all, you know. Um, like I'd never expected him to come back and to actually, you know, see him here in Ireland, you know. Um, yeah, there was kind of resolution to it, and, and with uh, George Ogan and everything that went down. Uh, yeah, healing, I didn't feel healing so much as like it was resolved. Yeah. Was, yeah, which is healing anyway, isn't it? You know, yeah, some sort of a, yeah. did you feel that there was a sense that you could move on from the whole thing yourself personally? You know, when, once Martin went again, because he's back in Mexico again now, of course. I, actually, to be honest, I don't think it did fundamentally change that. No, yeah. No, I don't think so. I think fundamentally the thing that happened for me was it was spurred me. This is my old teacher coming back, yeah? And it spurred me to put together a few things that have ended up in that book right now. Uh, he, that's why I acknowledge you in the book, to start the ball rolling, because you brought my old teacher back. And I felt like a little bit of a school kid, I, I thinking, Jesus, what have I done since you were away? And I keep meaning to do this, and I haven't done it, you know? So I gave myself a cut the arse. You know? Well, I, I have to say the result is very, very impressive. I'm delighted that, you know, that's happened. And um, I, what we'll, we'll talk in a moment about where your book's going to be available and when it's going to be launched. But before that, because we were talking earlier, you're already talking about more work. You're going to write another book, aren't you? Um, well, I'm going to rewrite another book and improve on the research and everything. Uh, which is the subject of Sheila Giggs. Um, 
you know, I did the, I think it's good the way it's worked, because the Shining Gig book, is, I got a bit too well known by, I, uh, when people start saying, ah, oh, Mr. Shining Gig, <laughs> when you meet them, you go, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but I don't mind going back to it now because uh, I think that might that book on the stone circles might put me back in the megalithic slot of it. Um, but it's a fascinating subject. I mean, it goes deeper and deeper. There's so much to be said on it. It's so fundamental, you know, uh, to an awful lot of things. Well, we look forward to that. But before I suppose you even do that, the stone circles of Ireland is you've you've um, you've kind of really self published this in a way, and you're trying to get it into the shops at the moment when can we expect to see it and how much will it cost and i suppose we have to ask you a little bit about the launch as well um well the i'm getting the book out now that's what i'm doing here uh i've just delivered the uh, a stop to tara newgrange um tomorrow i'll see if a few bookshops in dublin might take it but uh, mostly that distribution, uh, that way, I think I'll have to go on the internet now. Uh, it's the old days are gone where you wander in shops. Or you'd sit around waiting yeah, for a buyer. Yeah, a lot of people order books on the internet now. Yeah, the, inter the internet is the way forward with self-publishing now. And I think it's going to make self-publishing more and more viable. I've been self-publishing for 25 years. But uh, that's had a very limited round and I haven't really pushed it. I've had, it's worked you know um it's not something that i'm making a living out of but it has worked it's kept it's kept going for 25 years uh but that but in the limited areas books on west cork and Kerry and mostly and, um but this this book is actually about trying to push the bounds of that self-publishing without getting called up too much in um big distribution companies and all the rest i'm just going to fly it along and See. How much is it going to cost? Um, it's a uh, reasonable fifteen euro. Yeah, that's quite uh, reasonable. It, you yeah. know, it's because it's it a big, is, yeah. it's a big sort of format. It's not sure a is, cheap yeah. looking job, is yeah. it? You know. No, it's not. So I'm, I'm actually doing it in cooperation with a printer publisher down in Cork, who's, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it, I, I'm doing the publishing of this up front. But he's going to help me with the whole internet, setting up websites, stuff like that. That's his bag this winter now, you know. Great, yeah. So, I mean, it's available for me. Um, uh, are people able to get it online? People can get it online. You can email they, me. Yeah, how do they contact you? Uh, or you can follow me on Facebook. You just look up Jack Roberts. All right, okay. Yeah, and I'm there. Excellent. And you're going to have a, a launch, at least one launch, aren't you? Uh, well, I'm hoping for somebody well-known to launch it for me down in West Court. But in case he's too busy, I won't say. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Martin Brennan, we know that yeah. much. <laughs> somebody even more famous than Martin Brennan. And then, then I'm going to have a second launch in Galway, because I live in Galway. And because uh, I became a little bit friendly with a, a hero, another hero of mine. Uh, which is Bob Quinn. Oh, yeah, the Atlantean. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Bob, even before he read it, said that he'd be probably up for giving me a launch in Charlie Burns's in uh, in Galway City because uh, he launched his book, Atlantean, in there. And, uh, and I'm a huge admirer of Bob, of Bob Quinn, visionary, you know, and an amazing character. So, yeah. And... Uh, well, I've asked uh, our present company, Anthony Murphy, if he might sort of do something similar well, on the uh, East Coast. I, I would be honoured, yeah. duly honoured to do that for you, Jack, because it's a tremendous publication. And uh, congratulations again. Just before we finish, I have to ask, because there are people listening who are probably wondering, do you have a favourite site in Cork and Kerry? I'm, I'm not, ex let's exclude Sligo and, and the Boyne Valley. Do you have a favourite stone circle of all the ones that you've studied? Well, funny enough, after seeing very many beautiful stone circles, very remote stone circles, big stone circles, um, 
I must say that Drombeg actually does shine out as a very special stone circle. Even though it's the one that everybody knows and they all visit it, the council have messed it up a little bit, but it because it has such a very profound alignment for a start, uh, it's a very, it's like, it's your sort of, um, how would you say, your classic example of, a, of what a, a stone circle should be. It's a stone circle, uh, you know, yeah. it's how we think of stone circles should be, a ring of lovely big standing stones. And, um, and there's this incredible alignment to the winter solstice sunset, which is using the cleft in the hills and everything. I tried to describe in the book how accurate that really, really is. It's not just uh, the sun plonks down over there. They actually use the sun at these places, or all these places, to, um, to really define the moment. You know, they're really cutting time to a sliver, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And Drumbeg just encompasses it all. It's the classic uh, recumbent stone circle, the Court Kerry series, and um, Glendor's lucky to have it up the road. They <laughs> sure are. Very, very good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jack Roberts, and the best of luck with your book, and I hope it does well for you, and I'm sure it will. Thanks.